Hello, welcome to the Governor's Master Plan for Aging Long-Term Services and Support Subcommittee meeting. My name is Amanda Lawrence. I'm the Project Director for the Master Plan for Aging. And this is the first of third meetings we will convene to discuss the LTC at Home benefit. Um, I'll go over a few logistics regarding today's meeting. So offered via phone and webinar only. Um, I do want to share that we have closed captioning available. You can access that at the bottom of your screen. And we will be taking public comment later in the meeting. We have time reserved for that. We'll share these instructions on how members of the public can unmute themselves or we will unmute them um, later. But I also wanna emphasize that we are always accepting public comment and meeting feedback via our email at engage at aging.ca.gov. And we'll also be recording and sharing all meeting materials on our agency webpage um, following this meeting. Now I'm going to hand it over to CDA Director Kim McCoy-Wade for welcome and introductions. Thank you, Amanda, and welcome to all of you, both our long-term services and support subcommittee members, uh, our partners, the Department of Healthcare Services, and uh, public attendees, which is at 350 and counting as we speak. So welcome to all of you. We are uh, very excited to be here today for this important partnership, partnership between departments, partnership among stakeholders, to really uh, to meet the moment, as our governor would say, in many ways, both to do, do new and bold things, to provide alternatives to skilled nursing facilities at this moment, but also to build on our long history as a state of providing alternatives uh, at home and commitment to deinstitutionalization for all aging uh, and disabled people. So it really is a, an important conversation and we're gonna jump right in. We're gonna do a brief overview of the proposal and really allow a lot of time for the stakeholder committee, uh, which has uh, organized themselves to present um, six different issues and uh, topics for discussion. So we'll get to that um, momentarily. But before we do that, I'm thrilled to introduce uh, Director Will Lightborn, my former director of social services and now the director at healthcare services to extend his words. Bill. Hey, thanks, Kim. Um, I really appreciate the, the chance to be part of this conversation, but also the importance of this um, issue. Um, as we're all too painfully aware, um, with the uh, COVID uh, pandemic, we have situations in which um, severe clusters of um, spread of infection are occurring in skilled nursing facilities, particularly in those facilities that serve um, the lowest income residents and, and, and uh, persons of color in those facilities. Um, and so the importance of the long-term care at home um, uh, strategy as a means of trying to reduce populations in facilities um, is something of, of obvious, you know, critical time sensitivity. So without any further delay, I'm going to turn it back to Kim to uh, get us going. Thanks. Thank you, Will. And let's welcome all the members of the subcommittee. Amanda, could you do the roll call, please? Sure. I will just call down here and please uh, say here if you are present. Um, Anna Acton. My Maya Altman. Here. Catherine Blakemore. Here. Catherine Barker. Christina Bass Hamilton. Hi, here. Donna Benton. Here. Patty Berg. Craig Cornett. Here. Susan DeMorris. Here. Karen Feast. Here. Julia Figueroa-McDonough. Figueroa Karen Kiesler. Here. Marty Lynch. Here. Peter Mendoza. Lydia Misalides. Here. Marty Amoto. Uh, here. Claire Ramsey. Here. Ellen Schmieding. Here. Sarah Steenhausen. Here. Jeff Tong. Here. Nina Weiler Harwell. Here. Brandy Wolf. Here. Thank you. Thank you. And a special welcome to Marty Lynch. This is his first uh, 
uh, meeting as a member of the subcommittee. We had a vacancy that Marty has been able to fill. He's been a longtime member of the full stakeholder advisory committee. So welcome and thank you, Marty, for additional service. Thank you. Uh, in this meeting, we are going to begin with an overview by our DHCS colleagues. JC Cooper was unable to join us today, but Anastasia Dodson and Lindy Harrington will lead us through. Then we'll have the six and I'm sure more questions. Uh, I will go over the process and schedule. Then we'll have the discussion organized by the LTSS subcommittee, public comment and closing and next steps. So without further ado, Anastasia and Lindy, I'll hand it off to you. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone, and so glad to be joining today on this very important topic. Uh, I'm Anastasia Dodson from the Department of Healthcare Services, and I'm going to briefly walk through the slides. And uh, my colleague, Lindy Harrington, um, as well as Renee Mallow, they, they may have further points to add, but of course, we want to have plenty of time for discussion. We have materials that have been posted on the website, including a detailed policy paper. These slides just touch on some of the highlights, but we would, um, of course, refer you all to the detailed policy paper for um, more specific information. So in, in general, when, we've, when we're looking at the um, purpose and the drive toward this policy, this long-term care at home policy, um, as both the, um, Director Lightburn and Director Wade have mentioned, you know, we're, we're in a very um, serious time right now with the COVID pandemic. And we see, um, you know, with great concern, what's happening in skilled nursing facilities, and um, looking for ways that we can um, decompress those facilities. At the same time, we have had a long tradition here in California of supporting home and community-based services, supporting choice for people, so that if they want to and are able to return home or to the community, that we provide uh, a full array of services ac across a a whole continuum of services for home and community-based services. And so we're building on that strong foundation that we have in California and giving, uh, looking for even more ways to provide choices to um, Medi-Cal beneficiaries and their families for living situations and long-term care settings. Um, we are envisioning this as this uh, new benefit that's being provided through state licensed agencies that would arrange for or directly provide um, skilled nursing care and related services. That, that um, vision that we have of state licensed agencies, again, is built off of some existing programs, um, but for all of these components, we're eager to get your feedback. Um, we, the, uh, another important purpose is to, as I've said, to decompress nursing facilities. Um, individuals who are currently residing in nursing facilities, allow them to safely move from a facility to home, and as well as those that may require nursing facility services in the future to avoid institutionalization. Let's see, and I have to make sure I'm looking at the right page to see the next slide here. But um, So as we look at, um, the, we're also thinking about um, those who are discharged from a hospital to a home placement to be successfully transitioned home in lieu of a nursing facility stay. Um, again, we want to support efforts to decompress um, residents at skilled nursing facilities. And we also want to think of this across all of our delivery systems in Medi-Cal. We have both a fever service and a managed care delivery system. And particularly for individuals who are at a skilled nursing facility and who are Medi-Cal eligible, many of those may be in our fee-for-service delivery system. So we, we're, we're envisioning a benefit that works across both delivery systems. So there are four main components to this model of care. And again, there's lots of details in the paper. Um, we have, we're envisioning an individual person-centered assessment and that borrows from experience that we've seen successful across many of our um, other models, whether it's our um, home and community-based waiver programs, um, CCI, and, and other uh, efforts that we have seen that assessment process that's, that's very successful. Transition services. So, um, and again, we can you know, talk more about that. We've seen, uh, we've put more details in our paper. Um, building on what's worked well with um, our Money Follows the Person or California Community Transitions Program and pairing up um, this model with those transition services. Care coordination, and we know that that's an essential part. We want to make sure that the right service is being delivered at the right time by the right provider 
and having appropriate care coordination is very important for that. And it, combining both medical and home and community-based services. Um, this has been a longstanding issue that there's been dialogue with this group about and as well as in other um, stakeholder settings about how to provide both. And it's not either or, but both. Okay, and as far as financing and cost, we're thinking of this as a um, bundled per diem rate that encompasses all of the services. And this is important because we want to make sure that there's the right incentive and no confusion about whose responsibility the services are and that the, um, the funding would be available to, to that one entity for all of those services. And um, Lindy can talk a little bit more about that, but we're looking at ways there could be um, rates based on tiered acuity rates, but that we do want also clinically appropriate utilization controls so that this is a cost-effective option in lieu of institutional placement. As far as federal authority, we're looking at a 1915I state plan, and this is different than um, what many of you have may have heard us talk about before as far as an 1115 waiver or even a 1915B, this 1915I has certain flexibilities that are not available through our 1915C waiver programs. And again, you may be familiar with the 1915C waiver programs. Those are the HCBA, Assisted Living Waiver, the, um, the Waiver for Californians with Developmental Disabilities. Those 1915C waiver programs are very helpful and very effective in California, but there are some limitations. And the 1915I state plan gives us some flexibilities. So what we're intending to do is um, develop this through a 1915I state plan and submit it as a formal request to the federal government in the fall of 2020. So right now, what we're doing on this webinar is kicking off the stakeholder effort that will inform the content to go into the 1915I. In this stakeholder process, we're hoping to engage the public through an iterative process, exchanging feedback and recommendations. We've got three LTSS subcommittee meetings, and we're also looking at um, other structured and targeted um, surveys, our, our DHCS stakeholder advisory committee, as well as a number of ad hoc discussions and breakout sessions. We have a dedicated email inbox, LTC at home at dhcs.ca.gov, and we're um, really appreciative of the, all the feedback that's coming into that inbox. We also have, um, we're creating a, a list of people so that as new iterations are um, available and we post it on our website, we can make announcements so people can send their email into that inbox and then we'll be able to um, add you to the distribution list. So I know I went through that um, very quickly. Um, I want to check and see if, uh, first off, if Lindy Harrington has any more that she wants to add on the um, fiscal aspects. Anastasia, I think you covered it. Okay. All right. So I think with that, uh, we'll hand it back to, um, to Kim and the team for um, the, the discussion that we're hoping to have here. Thank you very much, uh, oh. DCS. Uh, let me remind people that there is a Q&A box if you are able to access us via webinar. And some questions have been asked. Uh, uh, some of the questions pointed to the links where all the materials we're referring to are posted. So if you need those documents, that's posted there. And we are tracking those questions and we'll uh, do our best to answer them in the session. Uh, and if not, we'll certainly do that in follow up. Uh, Thank you to the uh, subcommittee for organizing where we have six topics teed up. I'll list them now. Uh, and one person from the committee is going to open up that section and we'll try to spend about five or 10 minutes on each. So we have about an hour for this conversation and then time for public comment and wrap up. Um, my, here are the six topics that I understand from the committee. First, equity. Second, the target populations and eligibility. Third, the service mix. Fourth, aligning the system with integration efforts. Fifth, licensing and provider requirements. That's come up in the chat again as a question of the Q&A, excuse me. And six, uh, other, shall we say. <laughs> all, all other things that have not yet come up and then we'll have some open discussion time as well. 
So thank you for organizing the conversation and identifying uh, kickoff speakers and questioners for each. We'll start with equity with Dr. Donna Benton, uh, Associate Professor of Gerontology, Director of the USC Family Care Caregiver Support Center. Dr. Benton. Thank you. Um, first of all, let me start by saying we really appreciate your making the effort to involve stakeholders as you design the long-term care at home benefit. As it's often said, nothing about us without us is critical to making any program successful. You know, I also want to paraphrase an advocate that I recently got an email from, uh, Mr. Park, and he noted that policymakers often in their rush to implement community-based services and programs can sometimes spend a little too much time considering what we're getting out of, such as skilled nursing facilities, but not give sufficient consideration and funding to what we're getting into and going into, such as an unresourced communities that are really the anticipated foundation for this state benefit. The lack of infrastructure and resources in ethnic and racial communities has really been underscored and brought to light by the disproportionate impact that COVID-19 has had on populations such as African Americans and older adults. The pandemic has removed the very thin veil that covered over massive health disparities and disparities in social determinants of health in our social and healthcare system. Therefore, it really is imperative that as you move forward with the design strategy for the long-term care at home benefit, you must explicitly discuss and incorporate policies to address issues of equity. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, your current draft is surprisingly silent about the importance of equity and addressing the specific needs of all populations across race, ethnicity, geographic region, age, disability, economic status, just to name a few factors. So for now, we have two questions that we would like addressed. One, we'd like to know when, where, how equity will be addressed in your development of the benefit. And two, also what equity tool are you using to ensure that you address the equity needs of the populations you plan to serve? And finally, um, I'd like to offer that you consult with the Equity and Diversity Subcommittee of our stakeholder group, who we do have equity tools that we could share with you. Uh, thank you, and I'll turn it over for questions or to the next speaker. Thank you, Dr. Benton. DHCS, would you like to respond? Sure, we're very happy to get any and all suggestions and certainly um, very much appreciate the expertise um, that the equity group and, and others um, can provide to us. We think that um, by having conversations just like this and um, with other providers who are in the communities um, that are most in need for this program, that that is one way that we can um, address equity because we realize being here in Sacramento at the state level, that's not always the best way to, to get a viewpoint of what's needed in local communities. So we very much honor that um, the local voice is needed here and the voice of people who have experience and expertise in this area is invaluable. So we would greatly appreciate your feedback and look forward to working with you. Other Are you going to be? Oh. Continue, Donna. Uh, I was just, uh, you know, thank you for that. And, you know, I know that we are important for, uh, you know, giving some of that feedback. I was just curious, um, as I said, we do have the equity uh, group that you can consult with. Do you have um, any ideas how you might put this all in writing? Or do you have some other things that maybe you didn't, you don't have on your current website around equity that you didn't incorporate? 
So the Department writing. of Healthcare, sorry, um, DHCS, uh, we have a, um, a, a series of briefs and information and data analysis that we do on a regular basis to address um, health disparities. And some of that data is obviously more health oriented rather than um, home and community based service oriented. But it is one of the things that we recognize that we need to look at and do a better job at. And so in the coming months, we, we want to um, take a better look at that. Um, but in the meantime, we do have some experts in the department around health disparities. And as much as they can um, provide some um, advice or you know, participation, we would be glad to have them. Um, but we also, get back to that medical versus home and community-based services model, um, mm -hmm. we, if there are local experts on this, we want to include those folks as well, because we know that um, some of these are non-medicalized type services, they're really um, community-based services. And, and there may be other colleagues from DHCS who want to chime in, so certainly welcome their feedback as well. So this is Renee. The only thing I'll add is one, thank you, Dr. Benton. It's a very important topic for us and one that has been coming up more and more. Um, and not that it's a new topic, so don't get me wrong there, but a very important topic. And certainly uh, we are looking forward to working with folks in this space in terms of how we can then add some additional refinements to our program. So thank you for your comments. It's um, Catherine, and if I might just uh, build for one second on uh, what Dr. Benton said. It, um, I think one of the things that's important is when you're thinking about target populations is understanding the data about who's in skilled nursing facilities um, and how long people have been there. Because in my experience, I, I often find that there are um, black and brown people that remain in nursing facilities longer than people from other racial groups. And part of that is the difficulty in you know, finding um, services in their community or um, a barrier often is finding a home people can return to because they might well have lost their housing. And, and I think that's something that's particularly important to be addressed. And there's a brief mention about not providing rent assistance, which I think will be a further, a, a further barrier. But I, w without getting all the way into it, I think one of the ways that we start is by looking at who's in nursing facilities now, for example, and what, what is the relative proportion of people that are moving out and how might we target specific um, services and approaches to people from communities that have had a harder time moving out of nursing facilities than some others. Thank you. Yes, and, and we are definitely looking at data analysis that's essential for this. And so, yes, great point. Any other comments before we move to our second topic? I want to acknowledge briefly that we are getting messages from people that they are not able to get in. We are at over 500 participants in this meeting. Uh, so we are uh, trying to address that as quickly as possible. Uh, but thank you for your interest and patience as we manage a very well attended meeting. Uh, to talk about target population, and eligibility is Claire Ramsey, Senior Staff Attorney at Justice and Aging. Claire. Yeah, hi. Um, so thank you um, for uh, the overview you gave us and for the design paper. Um, I really wanted to drill down on sort of how you are thinking about uh, the target populations in a really sort of pragmatic and specific way. Um, so I, I do understand that there's sort of three major categories that you're looking at, sort of the short-term skilled nursing, um, the long-term skilled nursing, which I understand to be sort of those living in the community at risk of institutionalization, and then those who are currently living in facilities but are low acuity and maybe good candidates for uh, moving out of um, those facilities. Um, and then my understanding is that there's sort of additional sort of criteria that at this point you're thinking of in terms of being on full scope Medi-Cal, 
uh, being 21 or over, not being in another 1915C or I uh, program, um, not transitioning into another congregate setting like an RCFE. Um, and so one of the things I was hoping to do is sort of drill down and for each of the three major subgroups sort of understand like who is this person who's going to benefit from the long-term care at home benefit who sort of couldn't use current existing programs to achieve the same results. So I'm trying to understand like um, if we start with the short-term person like I'm and, and please, you know, correct me if anything. So like, let's say you have somebody, they're 60, they're on full scope Medi-Cal, they've broken a hip, they are in the hospital for the new hip, and then the typical path would be rehab. Is that like sort of, is that, have I framed like at the most minimal level, like the person you're imagining is getting the short-term benefit, like an individual sort of a particular need, health need around hospital, sniff, home, diversion, uh, versus like chronic conditions or other long-term issues. You're sort of seeing it sort of as a, um, not a chronic condition, but like a point in time issue. Is that, are we correctly identifying that person? Part of what we um, have on, on our to-do list, but again, we can partner with all of you on is doing further data analysis to provide more specificity. But what we're looking at is in that category, there could be some people who might need just home health without a full array of home and community-based services. So we are not intending to um, take the place of someone who m might not necessarily need that, that sort of more robust array but there could be some people who would need a, a wider range of benefits and would be appropriate for this um, this benefit. And so what we will need to do, and that's part of also thinking about the assessment tool and, and thinking about um, as there's a, a, someone who's either in the hospital or in a nursing facility, having that assessment help determine what's the best uh, benefit for them. And that may be that in that situation, they're working through their managed care plan, their Medi-Cal managed care plan. And the health plan can also be helpful in figuring out, okay, let's get an assessment in. There's, there's, there's more um, needs here than just sort of a, a simple healing of the hip. There's um, you know, a, a greater need here. And that's where the assessment would, would help. And, and you're seeing this as the, these services for the short-term person would be sort of beyond the scope of what a typical managed care plan might be able to offer already through for sort of short term sort of transitions, um, you know, whether it's sort of home nursing or, uh, you know, PT in the home or something that you're seeing it something additional wrapping around the person in this case. Right. With, yes. When the need is greater. Yes. And, and certainly Lindy and Renee, feel free to chime in on this. Yeah, and this is Renee. So one of the things we just want to make sure that it's clear, we're looking to, we're not necessarily looking to say we're not going to provide X, Y, or Z, but we're looking at this as yet another complement of services or a benefit that would be available under the Medi-Cal program. The benefit would be available to both our fee-for-service and our managed care um, beneficiaries that are enrolled in our program. And then just thinking about, because you know, as we've been looking at the issues with COVID-19 and thinking about um, individuals that are in nursing homes and not to be dismissive of the existing programs that we have in place, but to Anastasia's earlier point, some of those programs are limited by enrollment numbers. And so with this being a benefit under the 1959, we have a greater ability to provide the benefit to more individuals. Not everyone um, is going to be eligible for the benefit, but then looking at using that assessment and thinking about things that might be needed to then help support that individual. And maybe those services and supports that they have a need for based upon the different levels that we're looking at in terms of short-term, long-term, or low acuity, 
They just need those services and supports for maybe a limited time period or a much longer time period. Mm -hmm. But what's that array of services? And, and again, we identified some things that we think would be beneficial, but certainly welcome input if there's something that we had missed. But putting this in the, the toolbox, so to speak, in mm -hmm. terms of the array of services that California has to offer to its populations. So we're not trying to replace or take away anything, but then just adding to that and making this benefit available to um, our populations that may have a need for these services. Thank you. So, so you're really imagining like right now in California, we, we have this set of services, a set of benefits, um, and we do have some targeted programs that have you know limits, caps on them, on enrollment and stuff. And so you're seeing as this adding capacity for individuals who might benefit from some of the existing programs, but because of limits and caps can't use those programs. Is it, I guess I'm just trying to get a sense in terms of, and I don't want to jump ahead too much to services because I know um, we're going to talk about that in a minute. So I'm just trying to really drill down on population who's being served. It's like, are, are they a group who would be typically eligible under a 1915C type waiver or eligible for uh, CBAS or MSSP or something like that, and just because of the uh, caps on those programs, they're not in those programs, or are we seeing this not having like a, not being analogous to those things? It, so one of the things about those programs to, to think through is those programs do require that you meet that otherwise identified institutional level of care. This one is kind of like you, for the 1915I, mm -hmm. you have a need for certain services and supports, but you don't necessarily have to meet an institutional level of care. So we look at it based upon what the assessed needs are, and then we develop a benefit of services that would then be made available to that individual. And so those services that are identified, not everyone is going to be eligible for every benefit but based upon what their identified need is and that the assessment that's done by the agency that's rendering the services, would then they would bring those services into the home for those individuals. One okay. of the things, yeah. Sorry, sorry. go ahead, I'm sorry. Oh, the only other thing I was gonna add, um, because sometimes, you know, as we have talked about this and you may see it, you'll see this kind of reference in the paper. We talk about it, in the context of hospice care for without the end of life care, because mm -hmm. just as a conceptual framework, not saying it's relegated to hospice agencies, but those agencies help to bring to the table an array of services based upon the need for someone who has been identified as being eligible for hospice. So we're looking at it in the same context because mm -hmm. then they'll make available those services through that agency or make arrangements for other services for that person to help maintain them in their home and to help ensure you know, that they're providing them with you know, safe and quality uh, type services. So we, we try to speak to it in that way to hopefully bring some greater clarity in terms of the benefit and what we're trying to um, effectuate here, mm -hmm. but recognizing what the needs are are gonna be based upon the assessment of the individual, based upon the tool that will ultimately be used by the agencies. And then okay. they have the availability of those services. And, and two, hopefully quick questions that, so um, I see on the bottom page three, you say uh, meet the threshold for skilled nursing level of care. And we're seeing that skilled nursing level of care not being the same as institutional level of care. Like those words mean different things. Yeah, I mean, they may, yeah, because they may have a need for skill services, mm -hmm. but also a need for maybe uh, skill therapy services. Okay. So to your earlier comment about someone maybe, you know, with a broken hip, mm -hmm. uh, maybe they have a very limited need for nursing, but really what they need help with is some of the therapies to then get them back, you right. know, to, you know, their normal state of being. Okay. So we're looking at it from, because from, the HCB, um, the HCBS services and the waivers we have like under 1915C authority, you otherwise have to meet an institutional level of care. This mm -hmm. is really based upon an identified set of services and supports that a person may have a need for. They could, you know, they could be eligible 
to go into a nursing home, but that would not be the sole criteria. Okay. That would then make them eligible for this benefit. Okay, that, that's, that, that, that's helpful. And then the other thing, I know other people might have questions in this area, but it was a little unclear to me whether dual eligible beneficiaries would be eligible for this benefit. Because I think at the top of page three, you mentioned people who are on Medicare, but then I think on page six, it sounds like that hasn't been decided yet. So I just wanted to get clarity around that. Yeah, and we would like. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry, Renee. Oh, well, go ahead. We would like to make them eligible. Yeah, we we would like to. It's certainly um, a, a very significant population that we think would benefit from this. But there are certainly interactions here with um, Medicare benefits and the payment structure would need some additional work. But we'll, we're hopeful that and you know. Lessons learned from CalMedi Connect or an interest from the federal government, we're, we're hopeful, but we, we have a little ways to go on that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it sounds like you're thinking there'll be a bunch, uh, these individuals will need skilled nursing uh, and not all of them necessarily will need HCBS as a part of that bundle of services, like because that might not be where their need lies. It sounds like it could all be in the skilled yeah. medical category. And we have to, the other thing too, is we also have to be able to identify how they're not duplicative. Mm -hmm. Because again, with the HCB, um, with the HCBS waivers, there are certain services and support. So we have to also make sure, um, and this is part of, you know, our discussions with CMS, is making sure that we're not duplicating effort with mm -hmm. these services and supports. Great. Thanks so much. I'll, I'll um turn my time back over to Kim or if anyone else on the committee has a question. Well, Claire, I think it is a good segue to the next set of questions that there'll be some overlap here on the service mix that Catherine Blakemore, the former Executive Director of Disability Rights California will introduce. Catherine. Perfect, thanks so much. And thanks again for, uh, to all of you that are um, taking the time to both walk us through this and, and answer uh, questions as we're trying just to uh, uh, better understand it. So. The, um, the, the area I have questions in is trying to better understand the array of services. So it, they're kind of spelled out in two different places. There's examples of services under each of the you know, sort of categories that Claire referenced of who might be eligible. And then on page six, there's a list of what is called medical and HCBS services. And then I think there's some references to some kind of coordinative functions that might get a person IHSS. But when I read the, the list of services, I see a pretty expansive list of the kinds of medical services that a person would be eligible for. And I don't actually see a, a, a very detailed explanation of what you would separately call HCBS services. And so it would be helpful, I think, if, if you could give examples for us of the other kinds of, of HCBS services you see this, uh, this group of eligible people um, being able to, to receive, and which of those might be provided through the agencies that are going to be providing this and which might be coordinated by those agencies. Thank you. That's a great question. And that's one that we're actually working on now. And in the interest of how <laughs> we know that this um, is important to get a draft out for you all to comment and um, not try to make it perfect from the start that we've, <laughs> we have we didn't line out each uh, um, home and community based service and how it would fit in. We do have a reference for IHSS and we're happy to talk a little more about that. Um, but it, it, it's a good question about, for example, CBAS or, or MSSP. And there are other um, uh, services provided through the Older Americans Act that um, what we would hope is that um, through the care plan that those um, services, if the, particularly if the individual is already using um, other home and community-based services, that those will be identified in the care plan and that the um, services that are provided through the long-term care at home benefit would recognize those other services that are, that are already being used. But to the extent that those are not being used and that they're appropriate, that's where, again, back putting it in the care plan, and then we would need to sort out on the financing side 
um, whether they're they're funded within the bundle or separately from the bundle if those services already exist and then so it sounds like two things one i think it would be useful to the now 535 people on the call just to talk about the interface with ihss and then second sort of maybe help us understand the timing by which you're going to flesh out kind of the other home and community-based services um, so that we can then have a, you know, a, a more robust discussion um, about that. Yeah, so we're aiming to have um, a document that gives a, a proposed um, layout amongst all of the home and community-based services and how it interfaces with this benefit um, for our next stakeholder meeting. And um, certainly if there's feedback that folks have in the meantime, uh, and I believe there may have been some questions um, in the, the document that you all had um, been working on. So we're happy to have your feedback and um, public comment, but we think that for IHSS in particular, that um, the model that the, um, has the interface between um, regional center services and IHSS is a good one in the sense that um, the county uh, social, social worker determines the hours and the eligibility for IHSS, and that would continue, but that there is close coordination um, with this benefit in thinking about and recognizing what IHSS hours are perhaps already authorized or would be authorized, and then what other services are needed in addition to IHSS. So recognizing that, um, again, that there are di different groups of people. Some people are already on IHSS. Some people might be applying for IHSS, um, and we want to make the benefit flexible for that. So let me just ask like one little question about that. So, you know, if you're not currently getting IHSS, there's going to be some time lag, right, be before you get them. Um, and so would you, is, is the vision that you would move into your home and the long-term care at home would provide that while you're going through that assessment process, et cetera? Or would it be you need to get that in place before you can move home? We would want to make sure that the services that someone needs to um, tra successfully transition home are available when they need it. So yes, there would be that flexibility so that if prior to IHSS eligibility and perhaps prior to getting a provider lined up, that the services that they need are available through an alternate means. Okay, and then I guess just two other um, comments I have is, you know, as you, as you know, in addition to the 1915 uh, DD waiver, there's also a 1915 I state plan, right? And there's a list of services that are available, as I recollect, I didn't go back and look at it today, but, um, that can be provided under under the DD 1915I. So is, do you have a thought, and maybe you haven't gotten there that far, is, is that going to be the same as what's provided under the, the DD, or you're looking at that to help inform you, or? We're looking at that list, but I think that um, we will definitely need to make sure that the list for this particular benefit is the, the most appropriate list. Um, and Renee may have some further thoughts on that. No, I, I was going to echo what you just said, um, Anastasia. I mean, what we have to do is make sure we're not being duplicative and that we can clearly demonstrate not just to all of you, you know, and interested parties, but also to CMS how we're, you know, clearly defining the sets of services for this particular population um, versus there being crossover because it, you wouldn't be in both. You would have the set of services that are most that are most appropriate for you, based upon what your needs are. Yeah, I just to me it provided like a way to think about kind of mm -hmm. uh, of what other services are are oh, potentially yeah, eligible. Absolutely. And yes, and and I mean I think my interest is in making the list of services potentially you know, broad because there's going to be different people. I mean, as you, as you noted, there's people that are going to be just over 21 and there's going to be people up to 
100 that might be eligible for this benefit and therefore a broad array of what people might be able to access again depending on their individual needs is going to be important and then my last kind of question and then i know there's other people that probably have specific service questions is you know there's there there was this mention of um you know moving home and not but not able to provide rent assistance so someone could do that. And one of the biggest barriers, and I alluded to this before, is that people went into a nursing home and because they were there for a period of time, they lost their house and they don't really have the money to pay first and last month's rent to get an apartment or whatever else it might be. And I don't know if I know what the solutions are, but for this to have sort of meaning, I think we have to wrestle with how do we, how do we think about where people are re returning to um, if they, if they don't have a, a a family member that they're returning to. So I don't know if I, I really don't have an answer to that. And I probably appreciate some limitations in Medicaid about it, but really want to just put a, a pin there to say, I think that's a barrier for lots of people. So I'll, I'll kind of yield my time back to other members of the, of the committee who I think might have specific questions about um, the services part. I have a question. This is Sarah Steenhausen. Um, thank you so much, Anastasia, Renee, and others um, for this um, helpful discussion. My question is around the service mix with regard to functional support services slash home and community-based services as, as well as the medical care services. I think it's just important to point out that we know that functional needs are often what drive health care costs. So, it does look like in this um, design paper that there is the emphasis on the skilled care services and the receipt of those in the home and potentially the coordination of home and community-based service benefits. But I would say that we also know that there is a challenge with capacity issues of the current home and community-based service system. And at the same time, people would be carved out of this program if they're already in another home and community-based waiver program. So. I'm trying to figure out how those services would be blended in because if you can't figure out how you're going to assess for and meet a person's functional needs, um, it could lead to the longer term problems with um, the healthcare issues. So it's just a point and kind of a consideration. Thank you. Yes, certainly we want, when, in thinking about the assessment, um, we want to be cognizant of that, and, and we will be very clear um, in upcoming documents about what home and community-based services would be um, potentially included and which, which programs are excluded so that um, we can get your feedback. Yeah. I, and the other thing, too, I, I cannot say thank you enough to all the committee members. Renee, we're having trouble hearing you. can't hear you. Oh, can you hear me now? I'm sorry. A little bit better, but keep trying. Let's see, is it I'm moving my face closer? So I don't know if that really helps or not, but can you hear me now? So so. Oh, I, I apologize. I so I'll, I'll try my best. Um I just want to say one, we really appreciate um the thoughtful comments that people are providing to us. And, and this was the very reason why we put the paper out. Uh, we recognize we don't have all of the answers. Um, but we certainly welcome and appreciate your thoughtfulness, your comments, and we're not going to, you know, we won't solve all the problems that are out there. Our goal is to, you know, take a step forward in terms of addressing the issues out there for our vulnerable populations and having services and supports in the home for them. But we really appreciate you all, you know, identifying areas and then also providing back to us additional considerations as you all have been doing thus far in terms of additional um, input that we need to put into not just the concept but ultimately what will become the actual 1959 application that we submit to CMS. So I just wanted to let you all you know to just say thank you right now we'll say it again at the end but I really do appreciate the, the comments that are coming in to us and again we may not have all the answers right now but it'll also help us in our thinking as we move along in this process collectively with all of you and other interested stakeholders. So thank you. So I have a Go question, ahead. Marty uh, Omoto, CD CAN uh, family member. 
Um, you know, so following up on what Catherine and Sarah was talking about the service mix, for, especially from other wavered, uh, other ACBS waivers. So, and I just trying to get my hands around this or so a person, let's say with developmental disabilities, like my sister who was accessing IHSS and let's say she was accessing supported living and the family was accessing rest, but how would all that, I'm, and they each have their own assessment processes. How, how just, and I know you don't have the details to fill in all the blanks. And by the way, it's good to see you, Renee. I haven't seen you for a long time. Um, how does that work? Uh, you know, because a person who has supported living under state law has to apply for IHSS first. And so they have that mix. So that mix has to stay in place for them to be eligible for uh, the remaining hours in supported living. So it, it gets a little complicated. And, uh, and then how permanent it, would that those benefits that mix be under this new long-term care at home because if it's not permanent then they go back and then they have to reestablish that those relationships again i mean it and that has been a problem with everyone right with all these different doors people have to go through so yeah no so so fair point on the multiple assessments um and recognize that that you know we've seen that and have heard that comment before um and this is really looking at the assessments based upon the needs for these particular services, but taking into consideration what are the other services and supports that people are, um, um, the other services and supports that they have a need for. Part of why we're looking at the 1915I authority, to your point, Marty, um, it's, it'll be something that then becomes a state plan benefit. It's not something we have to ask CMS for ongoing approval and authority, it becomes a state plan benefit under our Medicaid program. And then the other thing too is, as we're looking at this, we still have to develop um, reimbursement, you know, a reimbursement methodology. The goal here is to look at this as something that is cost neutral. The extent to which we try to make this everything for everyone, um, it will be cost prohibitive for us. So we have to think about it in that lens as well, in terms of the service mix and recognizing that there, there may be other services and supports out there that that person is receiving. So we're not looking to necessarily disrupt that because that would not be helpful, but how can this, these services then be brought in to also help to you know, further support that individual? I'm going to lean in and see if we can, uh, if I have the committee's permission to move on to the next issue that you've teed up, just so we cover them all and also have time for public comment. I want to remind the public that there is the Q&A box open. We've got a couple dozen questions. Those will all be answered in writing, if not here today. We will have public comment at the end of this meeting and, of course, at the next two meetings as well. And there's the email um, that you can always send written comments into the design uh, on the design paper or any other aspect of this. So multiple channels to hear from you. Uh, Maya and Marty, I'm going to give you a visible high five when it's been five minutes and hope you can uh, try to bring it in under 10. We have uh, the dynamic duo of uh, speaking on health systems integration, Maya Altman, the CEO of the Health Plan of San Mateo, and Marty Lynch, the CEO Emeritus of Lifelong Medical Care. Welcome to you both. Okay, um, thank you, Kim. So I'm going to kick it off. Um, uh, you know, I really understand the urgency behind this, um, this proposed benefit, and I applaud you. This is a bold proposal. Um, you know, two-thirds of the deaths in our county from COVID have been in SNFs or congregate settings, so I understand we need to move fast. At the same time, um, I think we're really concerned about any new program pro or program that it aligns with uh, the long-term vision for integration of health with other services the kind of vision that um, DHCS um, started to lay out so well in CalAIM. And, um, you know, that a new program just doesn't add to the fragmentation <laughs> that we're, we're all dealing with in the, you know, multiple um, array of programs. Um, um, also wanted to comment on the duels, and Claire certainly um, emphasized this, but, you know, uh, there are about 2.1 million duels and SPDs in California about 1.4 million or two thirds of those people are duals. 
So this population that we're talking about, so many of them are dual, so we have to figure that piece out um, or else we leave out a lot of people who really um, need, need this kind of service. Um, the other issue I wanted to raise is um, the, uh, the role of managed care. Um, because Cal AIM really envisioned that more that more services would be consolidated under managed care as a um, as, the, as the accountable en entities. So I want to make sure that we're really capitalizing on the experiences and resources, and what we've learned from the higher performing CCI health plans. So for example, at my plan, we've been doing transitions and diversions from nursing facilities for five years now using some of the tools available in CCI. And we've learned a lot about what works and what doesn't work. So at first blush, you know, the framework that I read in your paper, I think it's a little bit too rigid. Um, so for example, we use a community-based organization, Institute on, Institute on Aging as the super coordinating agency. And they're a social worker driven model. They're not a medical model. And they focus on the social needs and all the non-medical services. So they coordinate with IHSS, with the CCT with the assisted living wa la waiver and the HCBA waiver. Um, we, the health plan, wrap the medical services around the social coordinating role, whether it's home health care or whatever medical services are needed. And from our experience, and I can't say this is true for everybody, from our experience, what drives the complex complexities of transitions and um, uh, diversions are social needs. It's, it's less the medical needs. And whether it's a need for housing or you know a whole array of social needs, so um, you know I really recommend that you start with the social model and then add the medical services onto that. And this seems to be going in a different direction. I st I understand some people they just need some simple medical services, but I think that is more available now. Um, um, I, I, one of the real tricks in this is um, you know, hospitals, it's so much easier for them to place somebody in a SNF. They're under time pressure to get that discharge done. And so I think diverting to home health care, it's, it's really getting into, like, into the hospital at the point, uh, at the point the person is admitted and working on a discharge plan then that isn't a discharge to a SNF. And so all those things have to be thought about. Um, so I just urge you, you know, I, I know it's always easier to do standardization, but I just don't want to standardize, see you standardize another new program that may be in the end just another siloed program. Um, I, the question I have, and this may be bleeding into the next topic, but it's why, why, did, the, why did the entities have to be licensed? Um, and again, I point to a CBO that does excellent service and is not a licensed uh, not licensed for this, you know, and maybe it could be, but I, I, what's driving the licensing? Is it a federal requirement or is it just something that you see that, that really needs to be in place? Thank you. Yeah, on the, on the question about licensing, um, we're, and you're right, we, we're looking at this um, starting with a, a medical model um, and thinking about what is the best way that we can ensure um, some type of um, consistency and oversight on the services to make sure that, um, you know, if this uh, entity is um, given such broad flexibility and authority to make sure that the, the right services are being delivered, in, including medical services, that there um, should be um, appropriate oversight. And so that's the uh, lens that we were looking at in thinking about uh, a CDPH uh, type of license for this type of agency. Um, but, you know, to your point, we, we can certainly look at other agencies that, um, for example, agencies that are um, uh, providers under our Home and Community-Based Alternatives Waiver um, or CCT and think about um, how would those types of providers um, assemble this array of services, but we, we do want to make sure that they have the right relationships with um, the medical care providers in order to um, meet the, the full array of needs. So fair point, and we'll keep looking at it. I don't know, Marty, did you? Uh, yeah, let me, yeah, thanks, Maya. Uh, thanks, Anastasia. Let me say a couple of words. Number one, I want to uh, just emphasize the importance of coming up with that integrated service package at the consumer level 
so so that the LTSS benefits and the primary health care actually look and feel like they're coordinated and folks are talking to each other and working to meet the needs of the consumer to, to which are typically in my experience functional needs yes you have acute medical needs as well but our functional needs um, so I would start with that and then I would go back to the duels question so CMS I'm sure my friends at DHCS saw the CMS just put out data on COVID in the Medicare population. And we saw, of course, that duels had probably four times the case rates and close to that on the hospitalization rates from COVID as well. Uh, so it seems to me, knowing that the, the nursing home population and the folks that are being hardest hit by COVID are in fact uh, the older population many, many, many of whom are duels, that we need to be thinking about how we can work this out with the feds to make this a benefit that's appropriate to dual eligibles. And then, uh, Anastasia, uh, maybe the question would be, assuming you can work that out, talk a little bit about how that might look a potential coordination between the LTSS services that are clearly on the Medi-Cal side and in a dual, the medical services that are clearly on the Medicare side for the most part at least. You might add in, if you could, while you talk about that, a little bit about how you imagine this fit, the new benefit fitting with the PACE uh, structure and how we might think about it vis-a-vis -vis PACE as well. So duels and how we can imagine that working and the integration happening across the two different programs and then uh, a little bit about how you see it interacting with PACE as well. Thank you. Yes, well, well, we, <laughs> the administration, we want all of that as well. So we, I can say that we, we really share the, the desire that, that you all have for um, integrating the, the across the models. Um, as far as the duels, issue we we want to have conversations with cms about this we want to look at um, what happens in um, hospice care and thinking about what benefits already exist on the medicare side so that it's not uh you know too much of a leap or a lift for cms if we can document that these are existing benefits it's just uh, packaging them together in a certain way that again is cost neutral and is much more beneficial, we think, for the outcomes. And that CMS, we think, would probably be um, in alignment with that. So um, that's where, you know, my colleague, Lindy Harrington, may have <laughs> other ideas as well on the, on the dual side. Lindy. Anastasia, I certainly understand that, um, you know, you get into the issue of savings. Uh, I'm also one of the people that believes that one of the things you're trying to manage is a person's overall health care and health care uh, use in the hospital and such. So certainly, you know, the cost neutrality issue becomes a more complex one with the duels. Uh, I don't know if Lindy was going to say anything, but if not, uh, Pace as well. Could you please? Yeah, no, I was just going to say, again, it's the complexity of, of, of the interaction between those and, and how you do the cost effectiveness. It's, it's really going to take a lot of conversations with CMS. Um, before we're able to to kind of weigh in more on on that component. So, um, again, our desire is to to have it be eligible, but it's going to take more conversation. And then uh, Anastasia, I'll defer to you on the the conversation around pace. Yeah, thank you, Wendy. Right. Yeah, and and for pace, um, we don't we certainly don't have um, the answer or even a specific pro proposal right now. It's an excellent question. But we know that um, PACE is already providing the, that full array of services. But if there are scenarios that we ought to be looking at, um, we're, we're happy to take a look at that. But just at first blush, it seems like PACE should be providing um, many of these services. But again, we're happy to look at um, examples or scenarios. And Thank hi, you. this is Ellen Schmeeding. I would just encourage you also to consider PACE as a potential provider 
similar to home health and hospice being called out just because they have the model perfected to provide that integrated system of care. So they, just as hospice does, PACE has that long uh, history of integration. Great point, thank you. I'm gonna keep moving us along, uh, Marty and my if, apologies. If I can move to Lydia for five minutes on licensing and providers and then Sarah to sum it up so that we can move to public comment. Uh, Lydia Misalidi, Executive Director of Alliance for Leadership and Education. Yes, thank you, Kim. Thanks, everyone. Well, uh, thanks to all my colleagues and for all of you from the departments for, for being here with us today. And um, really great conversation. I have many questions, but my job is to ask you some questions about the licensure, which uh, Maya has alluded to, and so has Ellen. And while I'm still not clear personally about the target population and how this is going to relate to decompression of both hospitals and nursing homes. Um, I do understand the urgency that we've discussed today and that all of us are keenly, keenly aware of for um, uh, avoidance of nursing home placement, if at all possible, whether short term or long term, as well as trying to move people out of nursing homes. So given the urgency of this time, we are just curious uh, why a new licensure category needs to be created when you've already heard from a number of colleagues about services that are already out there, whether they're health facility licensed, like uh, community-based adult services, already a health licensed provider, or programs like CCT and others. Um, it seems to me for expediency and also for the knowledge set that is, exists among these uh, providers, given the social determinants of health focus that we all know drives a lot of these longer term nursing home placements in particular, as well as getting very complex people out of hospital after a, a long stay um, or a complicated um, surgery of some sort. Um, why it might not be more efficient and why it might be more expedient to utilize, identify and utilize these existing licensed or other provider types like a CCT, if we wanna call them that, make some changes to what needs to be changed to give them greater flexibility or some standardization as you've identified, which I, I totally understand, um, balanced with flexibility, and then um, be able to move things forward a little bit more um, expeditiously because understanding licensure, getting a new licensure category stood up is time consuming, a lot of regulatory um, hurdles. Also, we have an address certification to be a Medi-Cal provider then to be paid and just being, you know, familiar with, with those processes because of my 30 years working with adult day health programs. Um, that was the nature of our conversation um, to prepare for today was um, what was the need for a brand new licensure category as opposed to repurposing our existing uh, system um, and expertise that's out there. So that would be my, um, and then given the fiscal resources that are very, very limited at this time too. So just, I uh, wanted to get your commentary on that kind of what are we missing in terms of the need and why a new licensure is needed. Yes, well, one, one thought that we had is um, certainly to leverage the existing licensure categories. So if, and, and this has been a, a dialogue within the administration, and um, I believe there's some CDPH colleagues on the, on the webinar as well, but um, thinking about what's, um, what's feasible as far as um, an, an equivalent or several um, equivalent or close to types of licensure categories and how could we perhaps do some type of a crosswalk, but we just hadn't quite, um, uh, you know, got to that point in the conversation when, when we launched it. But um, we, again, we just exactly as you said, we want to balance the um, safety and oversight issues with practical terms about how we can get this launched and, but, and, and being realistic too about there may be providers that are very interested, but may not quite yet have the, um, full suite of, you know, services or skills. And, um, you know, although we want to launch this uh, in very early 2021, um, perhaps there will be some providers and then more providers could come online later in the year. Um, but we want to try to leverage what we can, but then um, make sure that we're, we have a, a safe minimum as far as the um, uh, licensure. 
Okay. And um, in terms of trying to imagine, thank you for that. Uh, that helps a lot in terms of, and we'll, we'll chat with you some more about that, I'm sure, the, the subcommittee. But in terms of the people that you're imagining um, that need to be diverted, if we just think about that group first, diverted from nursing home placement, as Maya said, the typical route is hospital to nursing home if somebody needs rehabilitation or recuperation of some sort. Who, what, what do those folks look like? And it seems like if today, if they could go home, they would go home because the hospitals want to get them um, home uh, as fast as possible. So can you maybe just give us an example of who you have in mind that where there's a barrier right now? Sorry. Great point. Yes. Yeah, so we're, we are working on um, some case studies. Um, but in the meantime, again, we back to that example of someone who had a broken hip, let's say, um, if they are, are normally living alone, if they um, have not really been sort of interfacing with um, home and community based services prior to whatever precipitated the hospital stay, if they, if they don't have um, sort of community support already in place, um, if there are, you know, uh, issues in their home where they may um, not have the sort of accessibility as far as the physical layout that they may need help with um, some of those as, as far as their transition. Um, and if certainly if there are um, cognitive uh, concerns, cognitive um, issues that may make their um, rehabilitation more challenging, those are the types of more complex situations that um, we would hope this benefit would address. Okay, thank you. I think that's my time, Kim. Thank you very much, Lydia. And Sarah Steenhausen is our Senior Policy Advisor at SCAN Foundation. Sarah, could you want to uh, sum up? <laughs> Sarah, you're on mute. You're muted. Sorry about that. Um, thank you so much, Kim, and thank you um, to DHCS staff for a really good uh, conversation that clearly there's, there's so much more we can continue to discuss. But I just wanted to note that um, the Long-Term Services and Support Subcommittee did develop a working draft of a position paper that will be updated um, based on today's conversation. And we hope to use that as kind of the frame for our conversations moving forward. But I think that the, in, in releasing this position paper, I think the main take home message is, first, we really appreciate the opportunity to um, enhance access to services in the community because ultimately improving population health and certainly addressing the health disparities and the challenges that we've all seen as a result of the COVID crisis um, is really rooted in equalizing access to home and community-based services as part of an integrated service delivery system that's connected, connecting medical care services, home and community-based services, behavioral, healthcare services as more of a whole person approach to care, which of course is something you all have been working on for quite some time. So we're hoping that this um, model can, um, you know, this approach and framework can be built into this model. Um, so we look forward to continuing the discussion and um, uh, appreciate the opportunity to engage. Thank you. At this point, I'm going to ask uh, our team to help us with public comment. I do want to acknowledge the uh, 60 open questions that have come in, ranging on topics like quality of care, access to care in rural areas, the importance of housing, and over and over again, this integration with current services, integration with current waivers, uh, a theme throughout. So those are all captured here and we see uh, DHCS and the, the cross department team will be working to answer those and provide answers. So thank you to uh, all of you for continuing to provide those and many more questions. I didn't, I didn't capture them all. Uh, Maria, can you facilitate us in the hand raising from our public? Yes, absolutely. We do have folks raising their hands. Um, somebody by the name of LTSS Advisory Committee will open your line. Thank you. Hi, this is Peter Mendoza. I guess maybe I wasn't in the room right. I've been trying to, I've been here since the beginning. There's a couple of quick questions. I'm a member of the LTSS Advisory Committee. This is Peter Mendoza. 
I wanted to know if we could talk a little bit about service coordination and how that would look like a little more in depth. It would also be helpful to have a little more clarification on the types of services through the waiver. I'm concerned that we, it sounds like we're looking towards licensed entities to be able to provide services under the waiver. And I think there's a role for community-based agencies and independent living centers. Also, I'm wondering if there's going to be service uh, services available for people who may need accessibility modifications to be able to move or supplemental services, for example, a backup service for when a PCA may not be able to show up or a direct care staff. The other thing I'm really concerned about is not being able to assist with housing or rent or a deposit is a barrier. And how much of an assessment is going to be done to ensure that the person um, being supported moves into the community of their choice as much as possible and enjoys the activities that they want to so they have choices as they uh, transition into the community. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. I think in the interest of hearing from the most voices, I'll just keep the public comment open. Uh, but DHCS or CDPH, if you want to reply, please do speak up. Next. Sorry, yes, next, uh, Nancy V. Hi, thank you so much. This is Nancy Volpert from Jewish Family Service in Los Angeles. I appreciate the start of this conversation and um, the amount of time that's been put into it. I particularly appreciate the members of the uh, stakeholder work group who have asked so many good questions. I think that um, my overarching question beyond the specifics is looking at this timeline. And I understand that you're trying to get something out quickly, but it seems that there are many, many, many questions that are yet to be determined and listening to um, our, our colleagues from DHCS, where there's talk about the data analysis that Anastasia mentions hasn't been done yet, the equity work that is going to come, that trying to do this in three meetings across five weeks on an hour, hour and a half each, like today, where there are 500 people on here who want to make comments and we're cutting off the members of the committee and their discussion and you're not gonna be able to get to all of us clearly that please take the time to do this thoughtfully so that we have time to really engage and make this the best possible approach. I, I again, I, I know you wanna get this done quickly, but isn't getting it done right um, better for all of the people in our state who can benefit um, and to please, please build in more time. So thank you very much. Thank you, Nancy. Um, Next, we have Fred Main. Fred, you're, you're self muted. There you go. Hello, thank you, uh, members of the committee. I'm Fred Main, uh, representing CalPACE, the program for all inclusive care for the elderly. CalPACE supports the concept of enabling uh, more Californians to get long term supports and services uh, at home and in the community. And we are very uh, interested, anxious to play a role in um, bringing that uh, to fruition. I wanted to point out that uh, as several of the presenters uh, made the point that we do think that the uh, proposed long-term uh, benefit uh, to be successful will have to integrate uh, medical and social services to a very high degree and uh, look forward to the department uh, fleshing that out uh, uh, more fully, and that uh, it should address the risk factors such as housing, transportation, and food, uh, things that already create challenges uh, for this popul for these populations. Uh, PACE already, as it was pointed out, uh, is doing this for a uh, frail 
uh, elderly population. Uh, we think we uh, do it uh, extremely well. And as a result, we do uh, make the request that uh, PACE organizations similar to the home health agencies and or hospice be considered for uh, either expedited licensing or excuse, um, just transfer of, of licensing. Many PACE programs already provide uh, services to uh, other populations, whether CBAS or uh, uh, waiver populations. So we uh, strongly believe we have the knowledge and uh, skill sets to expand that. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we've got M. Cabrera. Hi, this is Michelle Cabrera with CBHDA, and uh, we represent the county behavioral health directors across California who um, manage the uh, specialty mental health and SVD benefits. Under Michelle, can you speak a little louder, please? Sure. Um, can you hear me now? Much better, thank you. Okay, great. Um, so with the County Behavioral Health Directors, and of course, we just have questions about how this benefit would intersect with um, individuals with serious mental illness and substance use disorder needs. Um, we saw that the benefit appears to align with the mild to moderate Medi-Cal benefit within managed care. However, it does uh, mention care coordination, which would be the responsibility of the agency with other carved out uh, benefits and a desire to avoid duplication. And so uh, wanna raise consideration for those issues, um, as well as just one sort of uh, overarching comment, which I think um, others on, on the um, advisory group raised, which is um, for those individuals who, you know, who do not have a uh, safe and secure home to go, go back to, I think uh, this proposal raises questions about fundamentally how uh, the, the new benefit would not exacerbate or deepen existing um, disparities, uh, particularly racial and ethnic disparities. Um, you know, so we were uh, just wanting to flag that as one of the things that we think needs to be explicitly looked at in trying to manage services for um, specialty mental health and SUD clients. Uh, County Behavioral Health often um, is left to uh, supplement Medi-Cal benefits and pay for housing services, supports, as well as housing itself. And we know from our attempts to um, secure homes for our clients that it, the market is really tough and there, there just aren't that many options for low income Californians. And so would hope that that issue would get um, addressed uh, more in order to avoid um, widening the disparities that currently exist. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Okay, next we have M. Kraus. You're open on our oh, There end. we go. Yep. There, thank you. Uh, thanks for letting me speak. Uh, and this has been a, a very good hour and a half that we're spending uh, and very impressive to watch. I represent uh, Fresenius Medical Care North America, and we're obviously a dialysis provider. Uh, and, and we look at care for patients with obviously with end-stage end renal disease who are at high risk for both COVID disease, but as you know, they're frequently elderly, they're frequently uh, of color, uh, and they're frequently at risk. And these patients with COVID have a higher risk of first getting the COVID. Secondly, if they get the, the disease process, their risk of mortality is about 16%. And then we look at that 9% of our patients that live in a sniff at any given month, their risk is even higher of both death and getting the disease. So we agree that these patients need to get home and we wanna assist in all ways we can to get these patients home and keep them home. And home dialysis, both peritoneal dialysis and home hemodialysis is essential. Unfortunately, it's a group of patients that are frequently overlooked as we look at the benefits that are available. And we'd like you to, as you look at what's available through this program, which seems to be very good, consider things like staff assisted home dialysis care as part of the long-term care mo at home model. And that, what that does is allow patients who let's say who are at home now and have an elderly partner helping them on dialysis, but the partner gets sick, may be able to stay at home and not go to a sniff while their partner's sick and they'll be able to get their dialysis. It allows patients who are in a sniff go home if they get that little assistance to help them 
care for themselves, and importantly, allows patients who are hospitalized looking at their options, the ability to go home and not go to a SNF. Uh, we know by talking to our patients, they actually want to stay home, uh, and we work very hard to get them there. But a little assistance and staff assistance for a period of time to allow them to do home dialysis might A, get them out of SNFs, and B, keep them from SNFs. Thanks. Uh, this is Anastasia. I just want to recognize what an important point that is. Um, certainly, the CMS data indicates that um, folks with ESRD are at a very high risk and very vulnerable. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, and um, next we have Jessica Ho. Hi there, this is Jessica. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, I represent Northeast Medical Services, uh, who we're also in the process of applying for a PACE program. So I just want to echo all the comments that were made about PACE, um, just as a consideration. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we got Mary Sheridan. Thank you for the opportunity to provide comment today. Um, as someone who's worked with family caregivers in the community for the last 40 or so years, <clears throat> I'm acutely sensitive to their invisibility in the larger healthcare system. There tends to be an assumption that once a family caregiver is identified, that box can be checked off and then assumptions are formed about what that person can and will do, what they can handle or that they can handle what falls to them to do with no assessment of the individual family caregiver's capacity to do or be what's needed in the particular situation. There's a passing reference in the detail paper that parenthetically includes caregiver assessment in the patient assessment. My experience tells me that a cursory assessment is not sufficient, that it needs to be as robust as the patient assessment and that it needs to include evaluation of the unpaid caregivers health, social, emotional, and physical capacities to provide care safely at home, just as it um, assesses these same things in order for the patient to be safely at home. Um, it needs to assess what kinds of supports family caregivers need to do this job that they probably didn't apply or train for. Um, on another point, the design of the program is said to be similar to the hospice benefit without the end of life component. I couldn't find any breakout about what kind of training family caregivers providing care at home should receive under the hospice benefit. Um, so again, I think this new benefit should assess what kinds of training individual caregivers need and should go beyond medical technical aspects that a given caregiver needs to address and provide training that also helps caregivers take care of their own needs as well as the patients. Many family caregivers are themselves elderly, frail, ailing, or working full time. The strain of caregiving can put family members at increased risk of depression, anxiety, fatigue, and um, often exacerbates their own existing health conditions. <clears throat> and finally, again, comparing to the hospice benefit Caregiver respite is limited to five days in a certified inpatient facility. And hospice is, of course, a time-limited benefit. It expects that the patient's life is limited. Um, the new long-term care at home benefit, um, as the wording says, is, is long-term and should certainly reconsider how much respite and in what format. Um, for example, there should be in-home respite um, options. Uh, to be considered. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mary. Um, next, we'll move on to. Gonna end end. Oh, Maria, we are going to end there. Okay. I see the six hands that are still up. I want to acknowledge uh, Amanda Sillers, Debbie Toth, Harry, Mitch Matthews, Catherine McPherson, and a anonymous handle. Uh, so thank you, and I'm sorry we are out of time. Uh, the you can always email engageca.org, but there is a special email for this project, LTC at home at dhcs.ca.gov, which is the primary email for this project that we will invite all public comments to that. I do wanna say for next steps, I heard the subcommittee will be finalizing a position paper that will be shared and DHCS and all the sister departments will be working on updating the design paper informed by this discussion 
answering the Q&A that came in through the Q&A feature of this webinar, uh, uh, summarizing out this meeting one, and of course, preparing for meeting two and three. Meeting two, we will be including in the agenda some other perspectives in addition to the ones we were able to hear from the LTSS subcommittee. So thank you to those of you who have volunteered and that will be coming out shortly. And then meeting three at the end of July. And as always, the doors are open at DHCS, CDA and all the departments involved. Thank you CDPH for being here as well to continue this very, very uh, urgent, but also uh, complicated and important discussion to get right on all fronts, equity, access, affordability, quality. Uh, so thank you very much. We will be continue the dialogue and see you and talk to you again very, very soon. Be well. Thank you. <clears throat>